Here we go. Yes, you're listening to Law and Gospel on this September the 7th in the year of our Lord 2023. I'm Pastor Tom Baker. And normally we have Wes Reimnitz with us on Thursdays, but he's moving today. So he'll be on with us tomorrow instead. What we're going to be doing today is taking a look at an email from a Robert Schumacher. And he's explaining the situation at Walgreens stores in San Francisco. You may not have heard of this, but many of the Walgreens stores in San Francisco have their products displayed in locked security cabinets. Why is that? Because of the shoplifting that has plagued its stores in the city. In fact, it's already shuttered 10 stores in the city and more will be closed down. Why is this? Because you can go into Walgreens and boy, steal up to $100 worth of stuff without really having trouble with the law. This is what Robin Schumacher calls San Francisco caught in a doom loop, D-O-O-M-L-O-O-P. He explains that doom loops start with a triggering event, often tied to a major industry, such as when manufacturing jobs began evaporating in Detroit during the 1970s. Tax income shrinks, services do also, businesses close, social disorder rises. This causes residents to leave, commuters and shoppers to bail, and the cycle spirals downward, which is precisely what he says is happening in San Francisco. John Shawkos, who owns one of the city's most well-known department stores, Gumps, G-U-M-P-S, paid for ad space in a print edition of San Francisco's Chronicle. And he ran an open letter decrying the state and moral decay of the city's downtown. In the article, Eric Sandberg summed up San Francisco's problem and was really important. The city has this kind of an attitude. Let people do whatever they want. So, Shoemaker has this question. If people are allowed to do whatever they want in San Francisco, Why don't they want to do good things instead of bad? Why isn't the city a blessed and happy utopia instead of a dark and mangled dystopia? The Babylon Bee answers this amusingly in one of their satire pieces saying, a newly released report has revealed that people are following their hearts at record levels with remarkably disastrous results. People are just being true to themselves. Why is everything so terrible? Said lead researcher, Tim Scottsdale. He says, it's almost like 
there is some innate depravity in the heart of man. It's very surprising. Well, it's not surprising to Christians because at least not to those of us with a Christian worldview. That's not to say that non-Christians haven't noticed the problem. <clears throat> the 18th century philosopher Jean Rousseau diagnosed the issue by saying that we're all born as innocent savages, but we get corrupted by society. Well, the fact is that Rousseau missed it. He believed that societies are composed of people who are supposedly born innocent. But the Bible makes clear that people are not. They are born with original sin. Others turn a blind eye to the problem, like psychologist Abraham Maslow. He said this, as far as I know, we just don't have any intrinsic instincts for evil. And Carl Rogers stated, I do not find that evil is inherent in human nature. Boy, when you have that kind of an attitude, that certainly is not Christian. As R.C. Sproul says, if each one of us is born without a sinful nature, how do we account for the universality of sin? If four billion people were born with no inclination to sin, with no corruption to their nature, we would reasonably expect, expect that at least some of them would refrain from sinning. But everybody sins without exception. And then we begin to wonder why. Theologian Francis Schaeffer layered our problem as man's dilemma. He wrote, man is able both to rise to great heights and to sink to great depths of cruelty and tragedy. He then asked, what hope we have in and of ourselves that we will get any better especially since the 20th century was the bloodiest in human history. So here we are in the 21st century where our current culture has never preached more about tolerance and morality, and yet it shows less acceptance, kindness, and moral respect toward others than in the past. Novelist Franz Kafka described our present situation when he said, the state we find ourselves in is sinful, quite independent of guilt. What does the Bible describe that? It describes that as having a conscience which is seared, 1 Timothy 4.2. And when you have people with seared consciences, they're running around doing whatever they want. They have no objective moral law constraining them, as in San Francisco. You experience what philosopher L.D. Rue called the madhouse option. 
which results in complete chaos and societal breakdown. The other choice in a secular only culture, said Rue, is a totalitarian option. And you can see how well that plays out. That plan delivers a horrifying, brutal culture, which gets worse and worse. C.S. Lewis has something to say about that. The more cruel you are, the more you will hate. And the more you hate, the more cruel you will become. And so on in a vicious circle forever. It's a different kind of doom loop, isn't it? Why do we hate? Well, we hate people who seem to have a better lifestyle than we have. They seem to have more money, better houses, nicer cars, better jobs, and therefore we speak out against them. That's where we become cruel. And the more cruel we become, the more hate we have. Of course, there is another possibility other than the madhouse or totalitarian options. Listen to what the Bible says about our brokenness and then listen to its plan to fix it. In the Psalms, David writes, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Psalm 51, verse 5. Do you understand what that means? Children are born inherently as sinners. They don't want anybody to tell them what to do. Is it not true that when parents have children, one of their main tasks is to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? That means to tell them when they are doing wrong. And that is something that every parent has learned. No parent has a sinless child. It reminds us of Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than anything else and is desperately sick. That's Jeremiah talking about that when he was dealing with the people of God, Israel, who were worshiping false idols. And they were deciding what is moral for them. This being the case, therefore, Ephesians 2, 3 reminds us By nature, we are children of wrath, and we are dead in trespasses and sins. That's Ephesians 2, verse 1. That has occurred ever since Adam and Eve believed Satan rather than God. And therefore, Psalm 58, 3 talks about that we go estranged from the womb. Now, John Wesley said this about our condition. Such is the freedom of the free will, free only to do evil free to drink iniquity like water, free to wander further and further from the living God 
and do more despite the spirit of grace. That's our freedom. We have the freedom to sin. But since the fall of Adam and Eve into sin, and all of us followed them, we don't have the freedom to really do good works. We may outwardly do good works. We may not steal. We may not kill. But our motivation is often sinful. What's in it for us is often our thinking. And therefore, until the Holy Spirit is given to us, either in the waters of baptism or through hearing the word of God, we are free only to sin. Any honest observer of history would have to concur with Wesley. Maybe this is why Reinhold Niebuhr once remarked, the doctrine of original sin is the only empirically verifiable doctrine of the Christian faith. Wow. And that was an unbeliever talking. He may not believe in the incarnation of Christ or his resurrection, but he did believe in the doctrine of original sin because it's everywhere you look. The city of San Francisco is just one example of what is happening throughout the United States and in other countries in the world where people are leaving the word of God and deciding for themselves what is evil, what is moral, etc. The doctrine of original sin is the one that's constantly in our face and nobody can deny it because you see it everywhere. You may hire people to work for you and at times you find that they're cheating you. In fact, I just saw a YouTube where a secretary of a Baptist church who was also the treasurer had taken $90,000 from the church and used it for her own items. She bought cars with it. She bought a swimming pool. And of course, there was a board of finance, but they were not looking carefully at what she was doing with the money. And a lot of people are shocked. I'm not shocked by that. I tell you, anytime you're dealing with money, you need to have a good board behind it. You need to have a paper trail so people can really see how much money is coming in, how much is going out. Now, what's the biblical antidote for this doom loop? Acts 2, verse 40. Be saved from this perverse generation. Boy, those are strong words. It's life-changing medicine. And guess what? It's proven effective. 100% of the time when people believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit desire to do the will of God. Now there are 
few in San Francisco that are willing to practice this remedy. They reject what the Bible has to say. Well, with it, there's going to be only one future conclusion. When we were examining the book of Proverbs by Solomon this week, it indicated that those who have rejected the Bible and have turned away from God's word have no future. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean that they're going to die that day? No. The future is referring to the future in heaven when they will live blissful lives if they trust in Jesus as their Savior. But those who reject the message of the Scriptures, the death of Jesus, his resurrection, his ascension, then there's only one other conclusion. And this is what Ezekiel 7, verses 6 and 7 say. An end is coming. The end has come. It has awakened against you. Behold, it has come. Your doom has come to you. That is what is meant by the doom loop. You have rejected the word of God. You have rejected his advice as to how to live a life of sanctification. And it's not that the Christian is totally righteous, whereas the unbeliever is totally unrighteous. No, to some degree, even the Christian at times is unrighteous in making decisions contrary to the word of God. The difference is repentance that occurs in the Christian lifestyle. Grief over what we have done to Jesus after all he has done for us. And therefore that grief also seeks for the forgiveness of sins. And that forgiveness is given to you because of the promises of Jesus Christ. Remember that promise from the cross? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. What does that mean? It's when you sin. It's when you decide, this is how I'm going to live my life, in contrast to the will of God. You don't realize that you are really breaking God's will, that you are hurting God, that you are spitting at Jesus on the cross, and that you have no faith that his resurrection or ascension means anything to you. This is the difference. And that's why it's so important that we attend church and a good church on a weekly level to hear the word of God preached and to share that message with others. Because there's one goal in Christianity, and that is to bring comfort to people. Comfort so they do not grieve over their sin and that they are not worried that their sin will send them to hell. Because in Christ Jesus, that sin is forgiven. And when it is forgiven, it means that it is not held accountable to you. It's held accountable instead 
to Jesus. Jesus is the one who died with your sins on his shoulders. And that was clear when he said, my God, my God, why have you left me alone on this cross? Or why have you forsaken me? And that's because Jesus had your sins on the cross. And by his death, when he says, it is finished, it meant that the payment for your sins was complete. Trust in Jesus means to believe the promises he has given us and to be assured that heaven will be our home. And it will be our home, not because of any good works that we have done, but because of the good works that Jesus has done for us. That's a message we want to share with everyone as we do so here on KFUO each and every day. Until tomorrow, I'm Tom Baker. We'll be back. God bless you. Listen to Law & Gospel each weekday morning at 9.30 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law & Gospel, please make your check out to Law & Gospel and mail to Law & Gospel P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri, 63132, or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962. Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.